suppose with a name like David Shepard, uh, you might have guessed that I teach scripture. Um, and with an accent like this, uh, you might have guessed that I'm originally from Cork. Not exactly from Cork, uh, more like Canada, uh, where we say things like uh, famous last words. I wonder how many of you have heard that phrase before, this phrase, famous last words, probably most of you. Famous last words, which means that someone's words may come back to haunt them. It's the sort of thing that, that my parents probably would have said to me. Um, perhaps your parents uh, might have said it to you. I may have said it to my own children um, uh, from time to time. But what about famous first words? You probably haven't heard that much before. Now, of course, none of us can really remember, can we, uh, for ourselves, what our first words were. Uh, but perhaps you've been told, your parents might have told you um, what your first words were, perhaps. Probably something like mama or dada or something similarly profound. But first words are important uh, because they signal the start of something. Uh, they're foundational. And I think the same thing is true in terms of theology. Uh, a word which, that word theology, which has words at its very heart. As you may know, theology uh, is derived from two words in Greek, theos, God, and logos, word. So in a sense, we can think of theology as words about God. Of course, as you will see, if you come in the autumn and you wander into the theology section of Trinity's library here, there have been an awful lot of words spoken about God uh, over the millennia. But it's, it's interesting to think about what the first words of Christian theology are, or, or at least the first words which were preserved or recorded. In fact, if I was to put that question to you, what are the first words of Christian theology? I wonder what you would say as you ponder that question. I mean, you might say well, it's the first words of Christian theology are the first words that we find in the New Testament. Or perhaps the first words in that New Testament that are about Christ, about the Moshiach, the Messiah. Well, things start to get interesting when we ask uh, where we find the first words about the Messiah. Because to find the first words about the Messiah, we have to leave what we call the New Testament and go back to Jesus' own Bible, which, of course, we call the Old Testament. And we know that. Uh, we know that we've got to go back there from some of uh, Jesus' own words, don't we? I'm thinking after his resurrection, we read in Luke chapter 24 that the risen Jesus has a, a bite of lunch with two followers on the road to Emmaus. And he says what? What does he say? He says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses the prophets and the Psalms might be fulfilled. And sure enough, if we look through the New Testament, we're offered plenty of other clues that we may need to go back further than our New Testament to find the first words of Christian theology. Think, for instance, of the story in the Synoptic Gospels illustrated by this stained glass window, which is found in Westminster Abbey in London. Now, as you look at this window, I wonder if you know what story is illustrated in this window. Who do we have here? You can see, I think you can see Elijah with the scroll who tells us who he is. You can see James, Peter, and John there toward the bottom. And uh, you can see Moses there to the left. And of course, Jesus. I wonder whether any of you can guess uh, what scene we have depicted here. Some of you, I'm sure, can guess. And if we were live and in person, then you would be shouting out, it's the transfiguration. And sure enough, it is the transfiguration. It's a story that we find in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As we know from Mark chapter 9, Jesus has led Peter, James, and John up a mountain. It's probably more like a hill. And suddenly, they're given a vision of Jesus along with Moses, who was giver of the law, and Elijah, who symbolizes the prophets, both of whom the disciples would have known from their Bible. Well, once Peter, James, and John get over the shock of seeing Elijah and Moses with Jesus, should it have surprised them? 
to find these great prophets with Jesus at the top of a mountain? Well, not if they remembered that in Exodus, Moses went up to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the law from God. And not if they remembered in their Bibles that in 1 Kings 19, when Elijah was depressed and discouraged, he climbed that very same mountain, Mount Sinai, in the hope that like Moses had in his day, Elijah too would hear from God. And the text tells us that he did. In fact, our and the disciples' expectations that God was going to speak to uh, them from this mountaintop, this gathering of prophets, well, their expectation would have been increased all the more when the text tells us that a cloud overshadowed them, especially if they remember that when Moses went up to hear from God on Mount Sinai, Exodus tells us that the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. So how do we know that Peter senses in this text that he's about to hear from God when the cloud descends? Well, because as you may recall from the story, Peter starts talking a load of rubbish. He's evidently scared out of his wits, just like when the cloud descends on Mount Sinai in Moses' time. And Exodus tells us that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And then, of course, the text tells us what? It tells us that Jesus was transfigured. Transfigured. As anyone who's read Harry Potter will know, to transfigure is to make one thing into another thing. It's the thing you learned to do in Miss McGonagall's class, as I'm sure you're all well aware. In fact, transfigured is exactly what the Greek word metamorphose means, literally to change form. Or in this story, in Jesus' case, to change clothes. How much of a change of clothes? Well, pretty dramatic. In fact, Mark tells us uh, in verse 3 of that text, Jesus' clothes became, what does he say, dazzling white, such that no one on earth could bleach them. Makes me wonder whether Mark did his own laundry. Maybe occasionally left a red sock in the white wash. We're not just talking about personal white here. This is more like, look away if you're not wearing your sunglasses white. In other words, scary white. Why scary white? Well, because Peter, James, and John, well, they knew their scriptures. And because they did, they knew what another prophet, Daniel, had said centuries before about a vision of God that he had once seen. Daniel said what? He said this, as I watched, thrones were set in place and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow. The disciples knew that the only one who wore clothes whiter than white was the ancient one, Father God himself. So to see Jesus wearing the same clothes, clothes which were impossibly white, well, that was a clue that Jesus was not just a prophet, something more, something much more. And of course, when God finally speaks from the cloud in verse 7 of that text, he confirms why Jesus is wearing God's clothes, because because what God says is this, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Just like, jo just like Moses, just like Elijah, the prophets of old, Jesus here climbs the mountain and hears the voice of God. And just like the prophets of old, Jesus regularly communicated God's word to God's people. And just like the prophets of old, Jesus did great things by the power of God. But the words the disciples hear confirm what their eyes have seen. Jesus is not just like the prophets of old, because Jesus isn't just a prophet at all. He is the Son of God. It's because Jesus is of the same substance as his Father, because as Paul would say, he is in very nature God. It's because of this, God says, that if they want to follow Jesus and follow God, they must listen to Jesus first words of Christology. The transfiguration is only one of many illustrations of the point that the famous first words of Christian theology are not even to be found in the New Testament, but in the First Testament. Indeed, John's gospel begins, how does it begin? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when John, it goes on to emphasize that in the beginning God created by means of that Word, He's actually pointing to the way in which the famous first words of Christian theology 
are really the first words of the whole Bible itself. In the beginning, God created. Genesis 1 verse 1. So it's because of examples like this that we feel it's important to offer a module on the MPhil, which explores the ways in which the first Christian's first words of theology were attempting to make sense of Jesus and his reality in light of the first words of theology that we find in their Bible and his Bible, the Hebrew Bible. And the other reason I teach the module like this is because I'm convinced that most of the best words of theology ever since have in some way flowed from the Bible's famous first words of theology. I mean, as you'll find out if you come in the autumn, I could go on, but we don't have all evening, so I better not do that. But thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you in the autumn.